Okay, I want to welcome everybody to this webinar. My name is Katie Warren with the Washington State Association of Head Start and ECAP, and I am really excited to welcome Katie Calton Brun, who's with the US Census Bureau and has actually come to our meetings and talked to our folks directly. And this is another opportunity for our early learning community to really learn about how important it is for us to get counted. So um, I will turn it over to you, Katie. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone attending this webinar. And happy Census Day! Woo! <laughs> so yes, as Katie mentioned, um, I work for the United States Census Bureau as a partnership specialist which means that I have been working to reach undercounted uh, populations. So today I am going to provide an overview of the census. We'll talk about ways to respond. We're also going to talk a little bit about the undercount of young children, as well as some outreach strategies, some things that we all can do to help our communities get an accurate count. Um, <clears throat> I will take questions at the end. Feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, I'm also going to try to speak as slowly as possible and take breaks between slides. Um, thank you, Maricela, for providing a translation today. Oops, hang on. There we go. All right, so what is the 2020 census? The census is a count of every person living in the United States. It is part of our constitution. It's actually so important that is the sixth line in our constitution. We, uh, the government has been doing this 1790. Uh, so this will be the 20 determine the seat that each state receives in Congress. It's also used to map legislative and state school uh, So why is the census important? Uh, two main reasons for power and for money. So the census um, help to, de uh, sorry, the census determines our state's representation. Um, it is used for reapportionment of those congressional seats, as well as redistricting of the legislative boundaries. Um, it is also used to determine how funding is distributed annually. The census provides a way to distribute funding fairly back to communities based upon population counts. The census is used for reapportionment. Uh, reapportionment is the process of dividing up the 435 representatives amongst the 50 states. So in 2010, uh, Washington gained a representative, bringing our total up to 10. Um, so we'll see what happens in 2020, depending on population counts. Um, the census is at our core of our democratic form of government. Our democracy depends on equal representation and determining that equal representation in Congress depends on the census. So let's talk about what this means for Washington. So our motto, sorry, our logo this year is shape the future. The reason why we chose that is because responses to the 2020 census will literally shape how the next 10 years of our lives span out in terms of funding. So the government uses census data to distribute more than $675 billion each year to our communities. Um, there was a study done by George Washington University, and they determined that for each person that's not counted, 
a community loses up to $2,300 a year. So for a family of five, if a family of five is not counted in the census, that's $115,000 over the course of 10 years that may not be awarded to a community based upon those responses. So this is funding for roads and schools and emergency response. It's funding for hospitals. It's funding for Head Start. It's funding for uh, food stamps and child care funding and home visiting. On the screen, I have listed the amount of funding that was awarded in 2016 based upon population counts. So in other words, the amount of funding we are getting for our child care programs and for our Head Start and ECAP programs is directly related to how many people respond to the census. Uh, the good thing is that responding to the census is quick and easy, and there are three ways to respond. You can respond online, so over a computer or on your smartphone. You can, you can call a 1-800 um, number, and you can also respond by mail or paper form. How is this going to work? Uh, the Census Bureau sends everyone five notifications in, mail, in the mail asking them to respond to the census. So by now, everyone should have received at least two letters from the Census Bureau asking them to respond to the census online or over the phone. After these final, sorry, after these five notifications, we have an operation we call non-response follow-up, which is the operation where we send census takers out to knock on doors for each person who hasn't responded. What we want to advocate is that people respond during this period from March through the month of April, and then they can avoid someone knocking on their door. For many people, um, walking on can be very invasive. Many people don't answer their door um, if they don't know who is there. So it is important that everyone respond to the census online over the phone so that we can avoid that um, door knocking. Also, as taxpayers, that is the most expensive part of the census, is sending the thousands of census takers out into a community to knock on doors. So we advocate that people self-respond to the census. Um, one thing that I find really exciting this year is that the census is actually going to be in 13 different languages. So someone can respond in any of those 13 different languages um, on the phone or online. We also have paper forms available in English and Spanish. And then we have 59 different language cards and guides online and on paper that include uh, many different dialects, American Sign Language, Braille, and large print. Those language cards and guides provide a uh, translation of the census and information about each question. So the third, uh, someone can respond by phone in any of these 13 different languages. There is a different phone number for each language, which makes it easier. Um, you can respond now. This is open seven days a week from 4 a.m. to 11 p.m. So what do we ask? The census is pretty simple. It is only 10 questions. Uh, it takes about 10 minutes to respond, but those results last for 10 entire years. So we ask for um, the address of the residence, whether it is rented or owned. We ask for a phone number, 
Uh, we ask how many people live at that address, their names, their sex, their age and date of birth, as well as their race and ethnicity. We also ask whether someone lives somewhere else. This is particularly important for young children, especially young children who um, they may be in a situation with joint custody. We want to make sure that um, they're not being counted twice. Finally, we ask, um, what is your relationship to each person in that household? So is it uh, mother, daughter? Is it sisters? Is it roommates? Uh, we did add same-sex couples to the form as well. Um, we ask people to count themselves where they live the majority of the time or where they are today on April 1st, Census Day, where they are living. So the census is completely confidential. Uh, your responses will be secure. They are safe. They are protected by federal law called Title 13. Uh, we only share information in statistical or aggregate form, and your responses cannot be used against you in any way, not by a court of law. So this means that we do not share information with ICE, we do not share it with Department of Homeland Security, we only share information for statistics. This is protected by Supreme Court law. As a Census Bureau employee, I've taken a lifetime oath that I can never share any personally identifiable information, or I face imprisonment or a fine up to $250,000. Um, an example of how Title 13 protects your information, uh, when President Truman was in office, they were doing construction on the White House and they needed to move President Truman to a temporary location so that they could complete that construction. They, the Secret Service called up the Census Bureau and asked for all of the names of the people living um, next to that temporary facility where they were housing President Truman so that they could conduct background um, background checks on all of the people living near President Truman. And the Census Bureau said, no, <laughs> that is against the law. It is against Title 13 Supreme Court law. So once again, the information is safe, it is confidential, and the government will not share any of your information um, except in statistical form. So I want to talk a little bit about what someone um, might expect if they um, encounter a Census Bureau worker. So for those who do not self-respond online, over the phone, or on paper, um, a Census Bureau worker will visit their house. This is what someone can expect. The Census Bureau worker will have a phone and a laptop that has a Census Bureau watermark. They will also have a badge with a photo ID and a name. They will hold up their badge and introduce themselves um, when they knock on your door. They will also have a Census uh, Bureau bag with a large logo. Um, they will never ask to come inside your house. They will never ask for your social security number, your bank account number, none of that. Um, if anyone has any questions whether or not someone works for the Census Bureau, they can call 1-800-923-8282 uh, to verify that person's identity. We want to make sure that um, the public can avoid any uh, fraudulent activity or scams. So once again, the Census Bureau will never send you an email. They will never ask you for social security, money, 
um, anything on behalf of a political party or any of your bank or credit card numbers. If this does happen, um, you can report the fraud by calling 1-800-923-8282. Um, if there is a visitor at your door who claims to work for the Census Bureau, but um, you are not able to verify their identity, you can also contact your local police department. So in light of the recent um, changes with COVID-19, the, uh, the Census Bureau has suspended field operations until April 15th. We want to protect the health and safety of the American public as well as its employees. So these field operations um, include enumeration of the homeless, um, those living in a group quarters such as hospitals, dormitories, prisons, uh, residential living facilities, um, mobile or transitory locations uh, such as counting people at um, RV parks, um, as well as mobile questionnaire assistance centers which is a like a census kiosk, um, uh, an area in the public where people can respond to the census. So those field operations and any of the door-to-door -door operations, those have been suspended until April 15th. However, um, you can still respond to the census in the safety of your own home without ever having to meet a census taker by responding online, over the phone or with that paper application. So let's talk a little bit about some of the historically undercounted communities. So these are communities that may not respond to the census. Um, they may be a bit more shy to respond. These communities include veterans, refugees, homeless, children under the age of five, senior citizens, disabled community, um, LGBTQ community, uh, renters, college students, farm workers or migrant workers, those with limited English proficiency, as well as the foreign born or the immigrant population. So why does this matter? Um, this is huge for our children. Um, and getting an accurate count of all children is very critical for educators and their students that serve local children because their 2020 census response will drive decisions about the distributions of federal funding or programs like special education, um, reduced price lunches, class sizes, uh, it also informs classroom technology, teacher trainings, things like Head Start and ECAP funding, um, playgrounds, public transportations, a variety of programs that are incredibly important for our children. So why do people often not respond to the census? What are some of the barriers? Um, for some, they may not understand what the census does, and why it's important. Um, others may assume that the census is time consuming or cumbersome, a lot of work. Um, some have concerns about data privacy, confidentiality, or having their information used by other federal ed agencies. Um, others may have a lack of trust in the government. And some may have a trouble completing the forms due to uh, language barriers. So let's talk a little bit more about the undercounted population of young children. So in 2010, during the census, an estimated 5% of children under the age of five were not counted. So this was about a million children, infants, and newborns. Many of these children came from complex households, from low-income, minority, and immigrant families. 
Um, but it's important that all children need to be counted. Even if they are born just now, just today on census day, they do need to be counted and they need to be counted where they are living. Of the time. Let's look at it. so the households that may not have counted the young, their young child. Um, they may have had more young children. Um, many of these families had joint custody, and some families may not have known how to count their child or which parent should have counted their child in the census. Um, some live in multi unit families, uh, sorry, multi unit unit buildings or their families living together in the same home. Um, there were also um, situations where children who were not counted if they were living with relatives or unrelated family. Um, children who were living in temporary situations may not have been counted. Um, and many of these children were low income. Some of the factors that played a role in this non-response, um, there were fears of confidentiality. There were fears of um, a bad outcome from a landlord, like I read case studies where um, a family may have thought that their landlord would charge them more rent if they found out they had another child. Um, so they did not include that young child on the census form. There were also studies done where um, children were living with non-relative uh, respondents, and they may not have known the exact ages or birth dates of the young child, so they did not include them on the form. And then there were a number of newborns, who, especially if they were born on census day or just before, who may not have been included on the form. One of the exciting things um, that the census brings is that since it is online, we are able to track response rates. Um, we do have an online response rate map that we're able to track um, our community and track response rates. We also have created a downloadable toolkit, and this is allowing people to have a response rate challenge by challenging their community and others' communities to improve their 2010 response rates. So let me see. We are going to look at response rates. So um, can everybody see the response rate map? So the national response rate, um, hold on, let me look at the chart. Can everybody see the response rate map? Sorry, I'm having trouble navigating back to the chat. Yes. Okay, great. So the national response rate is at 38.4%. Um, that actually is good. That's several percentages up from yesterday. And let's see, Washington is at 42%. All right, that is pretty good. Um, it was at 38% yesterday, so we've gained a few percentage. Ooh, and we are higher than Idaho. So Washington is currently the leader in the Western region. We are number one for our region. So that is very exciting. Excited to hear that. So let's take a look a little bit closer. So I clicked on the state and then I'm gonna go ahead and click on city and we'll take a look at how these response rates vary all across the state. No, get out of there you guys, out, out. So we are at 42% self-response here. So Seattle's at 46.3. Spokane is at 46.7%. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, Richland is at 50.2% and 53.2. It looks like West Richland is actually in the lead for our state. Walla Walla, 46. Vancouver, 43.8%. And let's see. Hey, can you share the link to the interactive map? We can actually see that. We can see your slide, but not the oh, interactive. I'm sorry. I was really hoping it would share. Um, if you just type in 2020census.gov um, slash response rates, you can do it in English and Spanish. Is there a way I can share this? Because it my screen yeah, is shared. Yeah, I think maybe you might be sharing just the PowerPoint rather than sharing whatever is on your screen. So if you, I think if you go to the share and um, uh, unshare and then reshare, but share just do the share screen thing instead of the share PowerPoint thing. Okay. Does that work? Did that work? All right. There we are. Okay. Me, oh. uh, I'm Katie from Census. I'm in the Spanish line. This is Maricela. Can you tell me exactly where you are? I get into the website of the Census 2020. Mm -hmm. There is a link on the Spanish board that you can click on that map and it should take you to the Spanish response, the response rate map in Spanish. Um, I get trouble uh, sharing the PowerPoint as a PowerPoint, uh, as a presentation. So in the, um, in, in which tab is the map? So on the slide, the PowerPoint slide that says census response rates, there is a link to the response rate map. I think uh, she's on the website, Katie. She's asking where. I'm asking in the, yes, thank you. Okay, I can. So if you want to just, um, the website is 2020census.gov. Yeah, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Slash en slash response dash rates dot html oh. okay i think that i have it now okay thank you and then you can go to the upper right hand corner of your screen and uh, change from english to spanish Thanks, Katie. Okay, so this is a really fun way to look around your state and see, you know, where, how people are responding, where the, the uh, are, where the low response rates are, for it's only four. Over here. Um, to challenge communities to help boost their response. Toggle higher. July, but we pushed the date back until August. Um, um, due to COVID-19. So we are currently census day. We are encouraging people to respond online. Uh, we are putting up um, information on our social media, encouraging our partners to share information and encourage other people to, to respond. Um, this will be going on throughout um, the next few months. 
The online website will be open until August 14th. We've extended that date um, until August. Um, the uh, door knocking operation, non-response follow-up, that actually won't begin until May 28th. It originally was going to begin at the beginning of May, um, but now we'll start um, on May 28th. Um, we, so we are encouraging people to respond as soon as possible and preferably before May 28th so that we can avoid um, anyone knocking at their door. So one of the ways that um, we have been working to conduct outreach is we have a great program called Statistics in Schools. So it is a program that uses census statistics to create classroom materials for grades pre-K through 12. Um, these activities have been developed by teachers and subject matter experts, and there are more than 200 free activities and resources online. Um, a few examples of some statistics in schools activities. Um, at the top of the slide, there is a lesson that takes children on a counting walk. So they encourage the students to walk around the classroom, guiding them to count the items they see, um, counting out loud, encouraging students to count each other even. Um, at the bottom of the screen, uh, there is a fun song about um, the census and about um, everyone counting. Um, these activities are all available in English and Spanish. They are free and they are online um, as well. Just census.gov statistics in schools. So we invite you to um, join the conversation online at any of these um, social media sites. Some of the ways that you can help um, get outreach in your community is, well, the first one is to respond at 2020census.gov. We have switched to online modes of communication and outreach, um, as well as using um, messaging resources and online toolkits to reach the community. So ways that you can help your community be accurately counted is to um, put up posters and signage. I know that um, currently that may not be um, doable. Um, start a response with a community or with another community, another city. Um, talk to parents about the census. Call or text them to remind them to complete the census and to count their cute little young children. <laughs> Use uh, statistics and schools activities in your classroom and also send out flyers or share information uh, videos on social media. Um, I have a variety of resources happy to send each of you. Um, so there's things that you don't have to create. You really just have to copy and paste, share the information with um, your, your community. Okay, so I would be happy to take questions here. Let me chat. Okay, I am going to go ahead and start from the beginning here. Okay, I filled out the census before college is shut down. I assumed my son would still be away at school. How should we amend that now that he's home? So, uh, your son should still be counted um, where he's living the majority of, of the time, which would be at the college. Um, so it looks like, um, was, was he counted at school? Because if so, that would be correct. She's saying he was not counted 
school. So I think she's asking how she would amend her census if she selected that he lived at college the majority of the time. So he should be counted at the college and if he lives um, on campus, then um, she shouldn't have to do anything because the campus dormitory is actually working directly with the Census Bureau to um, share information about who lives on campus. So we work with administrators, like housing um, directors on each campus um, to get the count of their students living on campus. If he is living off campus, but near campus, and is temporarily relocated due to COVID-19, he sh still should be counted where he normally would be living um, near campus. If he was not counted correctly, then you're welcome to call that 1-800 number and amend your, um, your census, essentially. So and she needs to call the 800 number to amend her census. Correct. Yes, in, in any of those 13 languages. Let's see, I completed my, the community center. I was able to print a copy. Um, Yes, for uh, security and confidentiality reasons, we don't allow people to print. Um, so there wouldn't, unfortunately, there isn't a, a way to get a printed copy of the census information. Um, unless, are you talking about the response rate map? It says, are we beating Oregon? <laughs> I think the main question is how can they get a printed copy of their census information if they printed it out in a public space? Um, they would not be able to for confidentiality, unfortunately. There is a confirmation page after you complete your census, and it provides you with um, 820 John with the, um, the address. And a confirmation. So you can print that out as, you know, this is my confirmation, I completed the census. And some people will even share that on social media, um, that type of thing, you know, I completed the census, but there isn't a way to get a printed copy for confidentiality reasons. Private reservation currently on the. Um, I don't think so. I know you can do count. Yeah, no, there is. I, I answered that question in the chat. You can go and choose the tribe I don't try. Okay. How do we account for our incarcerated loved ones? So yes, that is something that the Census Bureau will work directly with um, the prisons doing a um, what's called a group quarters enumeration. And that's one of the um, activities that has been suspended until April 15th in lieu of COVID-19. Uh, COVID so the Census Bureau will um, work with the prison to count those prisons. He was not counted at school. Oh, he lives in the dormitory. So yes, if he lives in the dorm, then the school will be counting him. The college will be counting um, all students living in the dorms. Okay, are there, are there any other questions? Maricela, any questions from the Spanish line? Yeah, give me one moment. I need to, um, I need to unmute everyone. And Okay, ¿tienen alguna pregunta en la línea de español? ¿No? Okay, ¿alguien más? Okay, no, it seems like they don't have any questions. Thank you so much for asking. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate um, all of you taking the time. Feel free to uh, contact me if you have any other questions about the census. 
Um, happy Census Day, and I um, appreciate all of you taking the time to um, attend this webinar. Yeah, and this is Katie, other Katie, and I will send out the materials that um, Katie Kaltenbrun shared. Um, I also, I'm going to put a little link in here to um, our webpage. We have a list of other webinars that are coming up that are great for parents and staff, including a family support meetup on Friday at 11. Um, <clears throat> so feel free to join us at any point. Um, and thank you so much, Katie, for doing this for our members. And um, uh, I wish you all an excellent afternoon. Yes, stay safe and healthy, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was Keegan. <laughs> thank you. Bye.